All right. So this is a bit of an older video. I was doing a lesson plan. I backed away from it because the stuff gets too static too quick. And I'm doing so much every day and learning so much. So in this one, you'll get to see error handling, looping, and then the other one was calling other workflows. So these are important things I do with N8N every day in my workflows. And so I just want to share them and focus on them for a moment. There's a forum link down below. I am starting a for forum that I can be present at daily, answer questions, and just start putting quality answers out there for people who are trying to learn to become builders and, and challenged every day with this work. Or just people who have ideas and want to build something, whether it's N8N or Lovable or whatever. All right, enjoy. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go over more advanced workflow designs, but there's even more advanced stuff. But in the end, there's a lot of practical stuff that we learned in the last module. And we'll learn in the hands-on module coming up in this training. And all these little pieces, they're like Lego bricks. They could become advanced as you put them together. But these are some really, these are three things. Two of them really matter, I think. The other one we'll talk about, but it's not going to be relative to most people. Let's first focus on calling other workflows, and we'll talk about handling errors, and then we'll talk about scaling. So let's see if I can zoom in here. So calling other workflows is pretty amazing. You can make this workflow reach out to another one, and then keep going or be done. Now, this even gets more amazing when you start to think about how you can use that with agents. So. First, let's just look at this workflow. If I run it, it's just going to use that to run Firecrawl. Now, I wouldn't do this here because I could just run Firecrawl here. That, that's the thing. You don't want to get too carried away with abstraction and separating concerns. Just, it's a new world, new paradigm. Just keep it simple. Now, in this case, I did this for a reason. And the one it's calling is this one. And this is just Firecrawl. I use it. But there's not much going on here. It's just give me a URL and I will do a search of the web. Not a search. It does a, It actually goes to the site and gets the page. I've been using Tavily for searching and it's been great. But why would I even bother with this? It even gets better. So in that case, I could have a complex workflow or something that has to do a lot and, and just let it go do its thing. So I could trigger that. And let me just do a edit field just so we have another one here. And it's a silly one, but we'll just put it here. But I could just tell it, hey, run, but don't wait. And so it would go do its thing when the trigger gets done. And then we just go right away to the next one. Versus this one where if I say wait, it will obviously wait for the thing to be done, then push the data over. So. Now, the big win for this is when we get into AI agents, if I could spell, sorry. All right. And then we start to do this other cool stuff. So let's, let me see here. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's go grab that. Okay, it's just that, okay. So I'm gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna move this over to the agent. Uh, we'll give ourselves, I don't know if Grok can do tools. I think Grok can do tools. Let's see what happens. But now we're going to tell, hey, use a tool. And we want to call that workflow. So we go from not being able to maybe, Firecrawl we could call because it is just HTTP. We could just call that. But now that it's there, now that maybe it's something else we couldn't have just called that simply, we can add it as a tool, which is amazing. That could be a complex database query with some other lookup stuff with collecting data from other parts of the web. It could be just so many things you can do there. I have one tool I can show you right now, actually. In a lot of these, <clears throat> in a lot of these, you can just get away with database queries like this one. But these I had to make more complex. And in the end, they're just database queries, but they had to do a little bit of cleanup beforehand and whatnot. So I could then hide some of, I don't even want to say hide. I could just put that stuff there and then call to it, which I couldn't do without that. And I don't want to say hide because again, it's not like code where you're trying to abstract everything out and use it once and blah, blah, blah. So in this case, this tool could call to that and do the query for me. Now, the reason it calls for query, and this is a new thing in N8N. So let's go back to what we had a moment ago. 
So yeah, I could have used that tool with that agent, which would have been, it's, I use it a lot where I tell the agent, hey, if you need to search the web, use this tool. <clears throat> it does have, actually not even search the web with that one. <clears throat> I could say to the agent, hey, go find these five web pages and give me some information about them and break them down. Like, it just depends on that particular use case. That guy I used to easily get data from a website and, and turn it to Markdown. But in this case, you'll see that it, it asked me for a query. And this is a new feature, which is nice. When you call an external workflow, it will ask you to define the fields below and you can then add them here. And then they show up over here when you finally add it. It's a new feature and I like it. It's actually been a lot better, a lot more predictable. So again, calling other workflows, what a win. That's just great. Handling errors is obviously very important. Handling errors is obviously very important. This one I'm about to show you had a lot of weak spots and things that would go wrong. And not because of the N8N, just because of things like APIs we were using would be 500 or whatever. I had to handle error in a couple ways and I wanted to show you three things. One is when you have anything that's doing a request, and sorry about the typo there, you can add this error pathway so by default, you just have success. But if you go into most nodes, you can say, who is this guy? You can say continue, but make an error output because you don't want it to stop. And this is a big deal because like you might have a loop in that loop, and I'll show you a loop after, but in that loop, it would stop and, and, and your whole thing would be done. Um, but you don't want uh, something to stop just because one thing in the loop stopped. You want to maybe catch that error or just go on, depending on what you're working on. So in this case, I say continue using error output. And when I do that, I get this. And then over here, it decides, to, it doesn't decide, I then make it go to Slack to then trigger an error. Now, if there's an uncaught error, we have our settings here that will call to my error workflow. This is how we kept finding these errors. Oh, I never thought Firecrawl would fail, and it did. I never thought this other thing wouldn't work, whatever it is, and it did. And so we get these errors and we go back to the template and we add them. So now you have all these pathways out, like, oh, your LLM didn't structure the data output well, so it failed, no big deal. Let's output it and then let the API that was making the request know we had an error and, and come track it and fix it. So you have errors that can be, when you don't catch them, go to that Slack or whatever, to another workflow, which is pretty crazy, right? You can then have another workflow that emails you or texts you or whatever, goes to another system, an error logging system. We're going to set up Checkmate in a while. I could go there. So, so you can see how strong that can get for flexibility. And then, of course, you just can keep going on in the loop. I'm going to show you a loop one. Let me find a loop one to show you one moment. Okay, so th this is uh, an example of a loop. And so back to our point about errors, we, we have a loop here. And we have a few loops, but any of these loops could have a problem. So, for example, we start our loop here, we go to AI, we go to structured output. But it could fail because we might not get the structured output we want and then it fails. But I don't want this whole loop to stop. I want it to go back around and try again, not again, try the next thing in the loop. So I'll probably have four things a day out of this query that are new that then I have to loop over and do all this work. So anywhere in this process, when we have an error, I still put it back into the, into the loop. So that's how you can, I want to show looping, but I'm showing it in context of errors. So in and of itself, just looking at looping now. So looping is when you have to iterate over a, a MySQL My query or some type of output, any type of query, any type of spreadsheet, anything really like that. And the tricky part about looping, and it's not tricky at all really, is first of all, you have your loop thread and then you go to the particular items do your work and then come back around eventually to the loop and keep going it also has a done where you could do something else you could notify someone it's done or you could trigger another workflow which this one's actually going to do and so you have your loop you have your going around and around you have your errors that keep going back to the loop even on the error out 
So this split out says, hey, something's gone wrong here. I'm going to go back. I think in this case, there's no data because sometimes structured data is hard. And this one is actually mid process because I was having so much trouble with the structured data. I had to accidentally, I, I found another way around it by using Tavily for search results. But now one thing to keep in mind with loops is loops need something to loop over. And sometimes data will come out in a way that you potentially have to split it. And so that's where the split comes in handy because if we look at a past execution, let's go grab one here. And, and you'll see, hey, this came out as one item. So as far as it was concerned, it was one item. But we know it's more than one item. And so what I had to do was say, hey, split the output field for me. And it would do that. This isn't always that easy. It sometimes is just tricky. But when you're in a situation where the particular item beforehand is trying to do it as a sub array or doesn't allow you to loop over it, reach for the split to then break it up. And then in that case, we can start to split loop over it. And that's very important because in this case, I had to take that data and then pass it into the next item. You know, so split's a good one when you want to take something from one place and really make it into something you can loop over. Uh, now, uh, in this case, I didn't go into a loop. Um, I went into this, and I don't know why, actually. I should come back to that. I think it's because of all the updates I've been doing. But my point is I could then go into the loop from here. Let's go try that one out. So what we'll do is we'll grab a sheet, Google Spreadsheet, so here we have a Google Sheet. And a Google Sheet, these are tricky because the Google Sheet's even harder because it's just going to spit on all these rows. So you really have to think about this. I, pagination, spreadsheets, things like that when they're really big are tricky. Not impossible, just tricky. What do we do? We, we just got all this data. We can't just hit it one thing with it, uh, a bulk insert, I guess you could. But we would loop over it. And then in this case, we would try to do something, obviously, with that data, right? Mm -hmm. So we would say, well, we don't have to do anything. We could just do that. And then we could say no op just to throw it at something. It's pretty irrelevant. So now when I trigger that, and sometimes I, if I do this guy, it should hit them all. Sometimes this can be hard when you have a bunch of stuff on the, on the sheet. But look, at, we might get a Google error because it's going to endlessly loop. So that's my bad there. So look, at, it's just going to keep going in Google. I did the loop too soon. Sorry, hold on. I meant to do the loop over here. And Google gets upset. Like you'll have to sometimes slow the um, loop down. And even though I love Google Sheets for these things, for giving customers quick one-off ideas of what can be or what the data is looking, it's nice. It's really good for reports and stuff. Sometimes you do have to put a little weight in front of there. Services receiving too many requests. Yeah. But you hopefully get the point is we can loop over that and then go do our thing and come back around where, when, when we're done with that iteration of the loop. So looping is very nice. I and mean, we do it all the time in coding for each arrays. All right, so we see calling other workflows. We see loops. We see handling errors. Now for the infamous one, depending on who you are and, and where you work, this might be on your mind. I've run a few servers now with N8N. None of them are huge. Two CPUs eight gigs of memory, maybe four. I don't have scaling issues. They're not huge processing systems, but they're not bad either. If you do have scaling issues though, it can scale. And it's a very simple pattern that we're all used to in the industry that have been doing this for a while, is you're basically just gonna set up 1.8n as your main brain. And then you're gonna have just worker N8Ns and they will sit on their own EC2s to, or sorry, not EC2s, please don't use Amazon unless you have to. They'll sit on their own um, servers. And then you can have a Redis queue that everybody needs to communicate to, uh, to then, you know, go back and forth and around. Okay, fine. SQS could be nice for that because it's easy to share. Um, just keep in mind that you can scale, but don't do it until you need to. Give any a try without it. Um, see how well it does. If your web calls aren't scaling, great. Go for those APIs, put them into N8N, have them scale. And remember, because N8N is free, 
Uh, you could have multiple instances running to do different jobs because it's so lightweight. So that's another way just to separate the load. But it can scale, and I don't think you should worry about it until you have to. And then when you have to, it's easy to spread it out and, and make it work. So that's the thing about scaling. Okay, loops. Here we go. Scaling. Uh, and you don't need the weight there. It's only there if I needed it there. And then handling errors. A lot of options there. And that's it. That's the gist of the more deeper dive in N8N so that we, when we do this hands-on, it will make sense, especially with the module before this. All right.